level of violence for more than a century. How, how long can you suppress a feeling? Right? How long can you suppress a feeling, man? The police lost control. Hundreds of officers were injured. Fighting, looting and burning filled Brixton streets. That was the mood of everybody. Kill or be killed. This is the story of why more than a 1,000 Londoners declared war on the police. They couldn't care what injuries they caused or, or even if they killed people. That was quite obvious. They were the enemy. Simple as that. Brixton is a warning of what can happen when a community feels targeted because of its culture or the colour of its skin. Nothing but nothing justifies what happened on Saturday night, and I cannot condemn it too strongly. It was a very good atmosphere before the, 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 the problem. Very good atmosphere. By the 1980s, Brixton, one of the most deprived corners of South London, was the undisputed capital of Black Britain. Brixton was a great place, you know. Everything that one needed was there. Because it was green banana, yam, sweet potato, Bad bread fruit, fruit and corn and mangoes and, you know, all these things Coconuts, that dribble them out water. Blood. You know, you could get them sugar cane and all these things. But now a second generation of young black people were growing up in Britain and expecting more from the country which was supposed to be their home, but where some politicians were prepared to play the race card. People are really rather afraid that this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. In 1981, two years into Margaret Thatcher's first government, race relations were at a crossroads. We now had on our hands a generation of young black people who were British uh, and who were not prepared to be as grateful, shall we say, as their parents for the new life that we had afforded them. As mass unemployment hit the black community hardest, one in every two black youths was left out of work. We had a feeling that we just weren't wanted in this country, weren't wanted, that we were despised. In January 1981, bitterness intensified when 13 black youngsters were burnt to death at a party in New Cross in southeast London. Three months later, the failure to charge anyone for what the black community was convinced was a racist attack seemed a betrayal by the police. We felt the police just didn't care. There was tensions already between us growing at the time, and that just pushed us further apart more than ever. You know, when I came to this country, I was told, if you get lost or if you have any problem, just go to a policeman. Oh, yes, we were told that. You know, yes. you would not ask anybody directions. You would go to a policeman because you see them as nice people. But by 1981, the relationship between police and the young black men growing up in areas like Brixton had degenerated to a point of no return. I'm, I'm in the underground and I'm in Oxford Circus changing tubes to come to Brixton. And that's when I first noticed these couple of men. They grabbed me. Um, excuse me, I'm arresting you for suspicion of pickpocketing from persons unknown. And I'm thinking, me, me no pickpocket, me a rasta. Almost every young black man in Brixton had a story to tell about police harassment or brutality. I remember um, getting on a bus one time from Brixton, going to Clapham, and they came on the bus and said I was nicking a purse, took me off the bus, couldn't find nothing on me, they just gave me a good kick in and sent me away. You know, what could you do? There's like five, six police and just you as a little black kid. 
They didn't arrest no one, they just beat us up and left us dead. I didn't join the police as a racist, but whilst I was in the police, I became one. We just went out and, and made a beeline for whosoever we wanted to, to arrest. So you'd say you'd seen them try two or three car door handles. You'd seen them sizing someone up at a bus stop and you'd see them put their hand towards the lady's handbag. People had no chance of proving their innocence. Evidence was planted, that was a common practice, and assaulting people was, was almost a daily occurrence. They used to raid dances. I was in one particular dance where they um, battered down the door, beat up women, beat up men. It was countless police vans outside on Elm Park that night. And I was one of those in one of the police vans taken back to Brixton Police Station. My face pressed down to the floor. There was a boot upon my neck, upon my back. And then we were dragged out to the police cells, sitting in that cell and hearing the screams of the older guys along the cell corridor, it was just frightening, frightening. So that's when I realised that um, these stories weren't extravagances. It was actually happening. We were uh, the occupying army, if you like, and thinking of uh, the people of, of Brixton as the enemy that there, you know, there wasn't a good person amongst them, um, that they were all criminals, that uh, blackness equated with criminality. Despite the close attentions of Brixton's police, there was one place where young black men did feel safe. Railton Road, in the heart of Brixton, was known locally as the front line. It was the only place that you felt really comfortable, that the police wouldn't just always be able to grab you. From this cruel world, we could go there and just be with our kin. It, we thought it belonged to the West Indian community. Everyone gathered on the front line. They had pool places, they had gambling houses. They, it was just like a little activity place. There's a hubbub of activity down there. It was just always something going on in the front line, always. It was the place to be, the place to be seen, the place where DJs practiced their rhymes, the place where you scored weed. I made my livelihood from there. That was all that was in my head, be on the front line and sell some dope, basically. <laughs> But with its mix of drugs, illegal drinking clubs and blues parties, Railton Road was on the front line of the war on crime for Brixton's police. It was a place where young blacks, uh, muggers or thieves or whatever congregated. A place where the police and the blacks were staring at each other. The crucial issue for the police in Brixton was street crime. There was twice as many muggings here as anywhere else in London. As far as Brixton's commander was concerned, the reason was simple. Is this racial crime? Is this black youths picking on old white ladies? Or is it everyone being attacked? I think you'll find that a large, very large proportion of this type of crime is committed by black youths. It's like you see the cloud and you, you feel, well, oh, it's going to rain because the cloud is dark. In the days before? Yeah. In the, in days, the days before, before. yes, yes. In April 1981, the police claimed crime in Brixton had reached a crisis point, with muggings going up nearly four times faster than in any other borough. Under the surface, there was always a, a fire smouldering, and it just needed something else to set it off. Brixton's police were about to provide that something. On April the 6th, they launched an undercover operation codenamed Swamp 81. 
but they used to wear these big black shoes. So they'd stand out a mile, even though they were in plain clothes, they always had that police shoes on. So if you wanted to know a policeman, just look at his feet and, and you'd see. On Monday morning, five days before rioting erupted, 10 squads of plainclothes police officers left Brixton Police Station. What I condoned was a build-up of police because the crime was building up within Brixton area and it seemed to me and experienced detective officers that a lot of it was emanating from the, the front line. It was simply stopping and searching any young black man that happened to move uh, in and around the central Brixton area. They just stop any and every black person, young or old, but especially kids. Everywhere you look, there was a, a Bobby there, him and his friend, walking up and down and harassing you and asking you to, to, to what you got in your pockets and stuff like that. And if you didn't want to tell him, he got a bit aggressive. <laughs> even on Routon Road. They was actually brave enough to come to the uh, top end of the line and make a number of arrests there before, wow, they're going to they're gonna try arrest us anywhere now. Tension was rising, but crime was falling. And as Muggins shrunk by half in the week of Swamp 81, the police claimed the operation an outright success. If you knew clearly that um, blacks were responsible for, for the greater number of muggings, than whites, you would be foolish. You don't have to be a trained officer to know that you would be foolish to go and chase whites rather than blacks. Quite obviously, in those sort of situations, you are going to catch a lot of innocent people in the net. Victimised for no other reason other than he is black. By Friday afternoon, after nearly a 1,000 stops had been made in a week, almost all of Brixton became alarmed by the tactics of the police. I was walking along Acre Lane, as usual, and I saw a policeman with a young black guy. And he was really giving it to him, boxing him, dragging him, thing. And my heart began to pound, you know, and I thought, oh my God, he's going to kill that boy. And um, then someone was coming up to me and I looked, and it was a tall, handsome policeman. And he looked down at me and he says, what are you looking at? And I says, I'm looking at the way he's doing that boy. And he says, mind your own business and go your way before you get your share. And for him to speak to me like that, I think that was dreadful. And my share of what? What was he going to do to me? I was just taken aback and disappointed. Swamp 81 had galvanised the whole community against the police. You can't say anything. You can't stand and look because you will be told, move on. And if you refuse, you would be arrested. We had no hope. So it come to a point now that we didn't care anymore. We didn't care anymore. What are you going to do? Just sit and take it? Uh-uh. In inner cities across Britain, anger towards the police and the government had been brewing. In just one week, Swamp 81 had pushed Brixton to the brink. As plainclothes officers went back on duty on Friday night, the police had no idea what they were walking into. Nothing looked out of the ordinary. Brixton was just getting ready for the weekend. I was actually in, in the pool room in Stasis playing um, the Space Invaders. I was like crazy about Space Invaders. I just used to sit on that machine forever. I was hustling, selling, selling my weed. I was thinking, as I usually did on a Friday evening, weekends here, 
Where am I going to go on Saturday, maybe Sunday? What clothes am I going to wear? What girls' numbers can I get? At about six o'clock, a young constable, a couple of months into service, was on what he thought was a routine call. It was a warm day, I remember that, because I had uh, just my shirt. I didn't, wasn't wearing a tunic, so I was in shirt sleeves, and we had new open collars there. He didn't have to wear a tie. With every young black man in Brixton seeing the police as the enemy, any event was ripe for misinterpretation. A fight in a pool hall was all it took to set things off. Eventually, I know that one man stabbed another man. And when you realise that he got stabbed, he ran out of, of Stasis. I saw coming towards me from a distance, someone running, not towards me, but in my direction. And there was a huge hole, a uh, huge gap in his back that was pouring blood. The police officer decided to question the injured youth a local called Michael Bailey. I think he must have been weak because he fell over. Uh, just as he fell over, there's a policeman that came down. I was then joined by several other black people. But we would all run out there thinking that, yeah, because, you know, you, you just want to see fire, innit? I tried to explain. But, I mean, I was covered in his blood as well by now and uh, he managed to get away. A couple of minutes later, I heard on the radio that the van unit had found him and that uh, they were trying to help him. Police records show the officers at the scene had already radioed for an ambulance, but the crowd refused to believe them. They're trying to nick the guy that's on the floor who's bleeding, so we're saying, look, can't you see that the man's bleeding? Can't you see that the man it looks like he's dying, because I'm sure I can remember he was changing colour. They were trying to help him in the back of the van, and uh, people's perceptions, again, that they were trying to hurt him. The hospital was like three, four minutes down the road. You'll be there in two minutes, as long as you put your sirens on. And they were saying, no, they can't do it, and they weren't going to take this guy in the back of their car. And it escalated from there. Within minutes, the misunderstanding had turned into a standoff as 40 black youths gathered around the police van with the stabbed man inside. I joined the melee. <laughs> I joined the melee, so to speak. You've got these three cops cornered, innit? And, you know what I mean? You're always being cornered by them. Next thing you know, bricks and stones and buckles start fling. Everything broke out right there and then. <laughs> On that day, I was part of a team that drove around in a van and the call came up for urgent assistance. Over the, bridge. the operators on the radio at Scotland Yard were calling for all available units to make their way there. The nearest brick, the nearest bottle, whatever came to hand, I just picked it up and started throwing it. There were police cars abandoned in a haphazard fashion, maybe three, four, five or more. They had to back off, you know what I mean? And they couldn't, some of them couldn't even get in their cars and reverse up the road, they had to run. We didn't know what to do. There was cops struggling and fighting with people. The police were outnumbered, and this was on a scale that I'd never seen before. It was great, it was, it was like what you always wanted to see, you always wanted to beat a policeman, isn't it? That's, that's just how it went. We eventually got back in the vehicles. We were all told to leave the area and go back to Brixton. So we did, we got in our vehicles and, and drove back. With surprise on their side, the 100 strong crowd had beaten 30 police officers into retreat. I felt at ease with myself. I didn't feel like I'd done something wrong. I just felt like I'd evened the score. With six officers injured and four police vehicles attacked, Brixton's police had been humiliated. But both sides believed the battle was over. As far as I was aware, that was it. You know what I mean? They got a good arson and, and this would be it, you know? But now, stories were spreading about Michael Bailey, the stabbed man who'd sparked the unrest. <laughs> In the night, 
there's nothing else to talk about. We was all talking about it and um, people knocking on the door. There was rumours around spreading that Michael had died. People were saying, no, oh, that, what kind of thing that? Why are him for dead? If he is dead, it was because of the, it was definitely because of the police, because he was there for quite a while on the floor. The police stab up somebody, that's what alerted us. The police stab up somebody. And that went round bricks from that wildfire. The police have actually killed a youth. And we thought, oh my God, they've really, gonna, they really got in for us now. But the injured man wasn't dead. He was recovering in hospital. So in a bid to calm local tempers, the police called in community leaders. You reach a point where you can't take any more. We're going to do something about it. What are we are going to do? You don't even know. But you start doing something. On the surface, Brixton looked peaceful. Community leaders pleaded with the police to keep it that way by stopping Swamp 81, the operation that had sparked so much local anger. If I'd have withdrawn, a lot of people would have seen that as surrender. And also, it would have laid me open to the charge of failing to police the area properly. It would have been beyond belief to have withdrawn police because somebody said, oh, I think you're doing it all wrong. I had a responsibility not only to Rowett and Row, but also to the people in Brixton. Feelings were running high. Violence had erupted just hours before, but the police ignored the black community's advice and decided Swamp 81, the hated war on street crime, would continue. The police can only police with the consent of the local community. And where the local community do not consent to the way in which the police operate, then there is going to be trouble. Saturdays, as the parish priest, my mind would have been concentrating on Palm Sunday the following day um, and uh, getting things ready for that. That morning, 48 plainclothes officers were getting ready to go out on patrol in Brixton to continue their operation. There were a lot of people there, and I, I do recall it felt, yeah, there was some tension in the air, but I couldn't put my finger on more than that. People who used to sleep to 3 o'clock in the afternoon were there in Brixton at 11 o'clock, just waiting to see what might happen next. Brixton looked a little more fuller than it did. Plus, there was a lot more police there. They're still stopping and searching people. They weren't interested in, like, let's calm it down because of what happened yesterday. It was still an intimidating kind of situation. That's the first time I could say I was ready for confrontation and was waiting for something to react against. That thing came just before five. A minicab driver came back to his base in Atlantic Road, just off the front line. That's where the minicab place used to be. Um, it was an African minicab driver by the name of Wadada. A few minutes later, two plainclothes officers stopped and searched the driver and his cab for drugs. So anyway, they searched the car, they didn't find any drugs, because obviously the man didn't have no drugs, he's it it just a minicab driver. As news of the incident with the cab driver spread through Brixton, a crowd began to gather. I remember kids running through the market. One guy kind of ran, and then two followed, and ten followed, and so on. You're running because you're excited, because things are happening and you're not involved. And then when I actually got onto Atlantic Road, I couldn't believe the numbers. Just a mass of people. I thought, yeah, this is all good. Outside the minicab office, a row was breaking out. Now, according to one of the police officers, he was threatened by a man in the crowd. And um, he walked across, and he stood on my foot. So I got up, and I pushed him off. And um, he staggered back, like, a couple of steps, and he came forward again, so I hit him. The next thing I knew, about 20-odd police officers in uniform officers came running across the street, and um, I said, so what, you're going to let them arrest me? 
When the police van arrived to take Johnny Brixton away, the crowd moved in. Anything could happen after this, anything. And that's when we realised, when we heard the sirens approaching us, this is where you've got to stand up and fight now, and this is going to be the moment. By then, the police had picked me up. I was, you know, picked me up off the floor, and they threw me into the back of the van. And that was rocked to the sides of people to trying to squeeze in and kick it and smashing the windows. Hundreds of youths, black and white, were ready for battle at the top of the front line. But neither police nor rioters were prepared for the scale of events to come. The police van tore away, the first bricks were thrown, and desperate calls for reinforcements went out across the Met. We were hearing police officers screaming, absolutely screaming for assistance. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I had, a, I had a cold chill that came over me. People were cut off, people were calling for help. So it did start to build up a picture for us before we got there. When reinforcements arrived at the top of the front line, the trouble seemed to be over. It was like driving into a ghost town, yes. It was very eerie, very quiet. We could still hear the radio going, so we knew that there were things going on, but we couldn't see it. We were all from different areas, nobody knew each other. But a dozen police officers is quite good, so we thought we were quite confident to hold that road and not let anybody through to the shopping centre, so we were quite jolly and happy. This was our, this was our target. Don't let anybody through here into Brixton town. We were going to hold it under all circumstances. I could hear police officers round the other road as well, which uh, sounded like they are under attack. This is when we saw our first rioters. And as we moved up to Roughton Road, that's when these people saw us and we became their targets. I can see the people coming down the road now. We desperately search for stones or anything, bricks. Once we find a piece, we'll pick it up, take a bit of a run up, charge down the road, throw it into the ranks and just hurl it. Look around for another piece of brick or whatever, and the sky was this darkened. Brick started to rain down. We had no shields. I remember at one stage grabbing hold of a dustbin lid. We were retreating. We were definitely retreating. We had to for our own safety. In that initial period, for the first half hour, hour, the police had absolutely no control whatsoever, which was very empowering, very, yeah, right, let's bring it to them. By six o'clock, the police were forced back to the top of Railton Road. They were already outnumbered, but more people, black and white, were arriving all the time. There was a group of us up um, Brixton Hill, and we were walking back towards Brixton when a pe few people were running up and there was police sirens going off everywhere. And um, somebody told us that they, it had kicked off big time down in um, the line. I think I got a phone call from a friend um, saying that there's something's happening in Brixton and it was a riot. And I didn't know what a riot was. So it was, it was a bit of a shock. I remember thinking, what's a riot? And then, then went down to investigate, as you do. I mean, everywhere was getting smashed at once. People were just getting into the shops, Woolworths, um, Bon Marsh. Um, the, every jeweler's in town was getting done. A lorry was hijacked by a couple of lads on Brixton Road and driven into the jeweler's window, straight through the jeweler's window. And the window was so thick, plate glass or whatever, it just rolled down like a carpet. I think it was at that point in my mind, I just thought, right, I'm going to try and get as many things as possible. It was like ants to honey. There were so many people in there, just diamond rings, sovereigns rolling down the pavements. I said they were dragging stuff and things were on the floor, jewellery and rings. And then you sort of put what you could in your pockets. And I felt really elated. I thought, right, I've got some jewellery now. I don't know how I'm going to wear it, but I'm going to... I've got some jewellery. We were getting something that we'd always wanted, that we weren't able to afford. And 
nobody was telling us what we couldn't do and what we could do. We were doing what we wanted to do. The chief superintendent at uh, Brixton phoned me and said, it's getting very ugly down here. Streams of ewes, mostly black, running up down the streets and windows have been smashed. And uh, I think you ought to come down. And I said, I couldn't agree more. So I took off my own car and, uh, and went down there. The police had lost total control of the place. You'd have like 100 people, 150 people throwing bricks and bottles at the police while the looters were looting. So the police couldn't get near there to catch any looters. Commander Fairburn arrived to a complete breakdown of law and order. Mayhem on this scale hadn't been witnessed that century and proved just how many in the community felt alienated by the police. Burning vehicles, rioters, policemen withdrawing. It was frightening to a certain extent. It was unnerving uh, and it was very sad. Seeing his men beaten back to the top of the front line, Commander Fairburn immediately ordered equipment and reinforcements. We finally got our shields and people were bringing them up to people in the front line. We came up the road but nobody knew how to use them and we were locked in one line. We became Aunt Sally's. We couldn't move because the idea of a shield is to go forward, to push the crowd back. And I remember being locked up and I remember seeing this bricks coming over and there's nothing I could do. I couldn't bring my shield up to defend myself. Um, I couldn't bring the shield down because it was just locked there. I had traffic officers to one side of me and, and admin staff that had never seen a shield, uh, women police officers that were not trained in shields those days. So all they were doing were hiding behind their shields, which we really should have gone forward. Whilst the police were locked up behind their shields, the rioters were preparing to move the battle up a gear. There was a sense of that after that first stone, maybe a bigger stone, maybe a bigger brick, maybe something even more evil to throw. Later on in the evening, then the, the new element came in, which was um, never seen before, and it was it's just a difference, and, and it was a potent weapon as well. It was called a petrol bomb. They just suddenly appeared. I don't know who was arranging them or whatever, but um, they were there on a curb. I was scared, I have to admit, I was scared at that point. Eventually, when we unlocked, we went forward. And as we went forward, we went forward as we should do in groups of three, but keeping in line. And the faster we went, the faster they ran away. And in the end, we were winning. We were winning Routon Road. For the first time in 24 hours, the police had seized the advantage. At that precise moment, the rioters unleashed their deadly weapon. A milk bottle smashed in front of me. So we were a bit worried because milk bottles can injure anyway, and so we sort of stepped back. But then when the next one came on and it hits... I mean, you know, what can you do against fire? The petrol bomb was hitting you flat on, and the petrol was going underneath the shields and then coming up and burning the foam underneath. To see the, those police putting their, their tail between their legs and, and hightailing it down the road was a sight to behold. It was just a wonderful sight. Eh? They were just all over the place, as I remember it. They were scared. It was the first time petrol bombs had ever been thrown on the British mainland. Decades of antagonism fueled the rioters' fury. That was the mood of everybody. Kill or be killed. People were screaming and shouting, and people were setting the light, and it was quite horrendous. It was quite horrendous. I remember I had a flashback to that police van moment with a boot on my neck. 
and how I felt. Why should I stop mid throw and say to myself, this is wrong, what you're doing is wrong. They were the enemy, simple as that. Not a nice experience. And you could see the ruddy things coming at you as well, that's the thing. Crouched behind their riot shields, the police withstood many... ...were hit by either stones, bottles or Molotov cocktails. Through Brixton, the South London area of high unemployment was under siege. Quite unlike anything London has seen. My abiding memory of Brixton was Brixton on fire. I'd never ever seen anything like this. Journalists and news crews were arriving in Brixton in force, expecting to find a race riot between black and white. Instead, they met all-out war between the police and the local community. The hostility between the black uh, young, young people in particular and the Metropolitan Police was something I hadn't encountered before, and I wasn't fully aware of, I must confess, uh, until that night. By now, the rioters were holding the whole of Railton Road, and they were determined to stop anyone in a uniform, not just the police, from entering their territory. I'd only been driving for two weeks, just qualified for two weeks. So I was really excited being a, a driver. We just came through uh, a police cordon at Brockwell Park. And just as we got through the first crowd, that's the first indication anything was wrong, because there was a loud bang on the side of the fire engine. I thought I'd hit somebody, and my station officer just turned around and he said, whatever you do, don't stop, keep going. I think it was a brick that first shattered the windscreen, I'm not sure. And once that was gone, there was no protection for the two of us in the front cab, the station officer and myself. Uh, we were just fair game from there on in. For the first time in their history, the fire brigade were under attack. Aggression was building. Even hardened journalists were stunned by what they found. This was just four miles down the road from the House of Parliament. This was a part of London. I'd experienced similar scenes in Northern Ireland. I'd never seen anything like this in a mainland city. Bricks, glass, paving slab hit me in the chest, and my arm was torn off the steering wheel with something smashing into my left arm. And you can see the anger in their face while they're throwing bricks and bottles and I was just so terrified. By seven in the evening, 50 police officers were reported seriously hurt. Casualties were mounting on both sides. The situation could soon prove fatal. The police were trying to take over their home, their territory, and that was the last thing they were going to let them do. Now, Reverend Bob Nind and three other community leaders tried to open talks between the two factions. The only way to, do, to defuse this situation is by decreasing the presence of the police within the area at the present time, because they see the police as their target, as the, as, as the target that they I want to attack. I understand exactly what you're saying, and I appreciate what you've already done. Where's he going from? But there is no question, in my decision at the moment, there is no question of withdrawing police from here. For the second time in 24 hours, the police had the opportunity to pull out. But despite heavy injuries in their ranks, the man in charge felt he couldn't take that chance. I knew from what I've been told, from the observations I've made myself, that they would have seen this as a victory over the police and they would have never withdrawn. Never. I just felt that he was wrong. Um, I hoped that he would reflect upon it. And having said what I could at that point, there was nothing much one could now do about it. I went back round the corner again. I didn't believe what they said. And the attitude of them, the shouting in the background, led me to believe this is this man telling me, but he has no rights justification 
in, in saying that they would stand down, so to speak, because I was pretty convinced they wouldn't. Night fell on Brixton. The possibility of peace had been lost. And familiar streets became terrifying. After a while, you often ask yourself, my God, how long can this go on? How long can we keep doing this? My colleagues were on fire, my colleagues have been injured, so now it's time people got arrested. Some of the police now began to change their tactics. A few streets away from the main police line, a photographer spotted some officers blocking off the road. I saw the police forming a cordon uh, behind me here, and at a suitable moment, I slipped through it and came down to see what was going on. And I found a group of policemen having tea, um, standing around the corner. They were relaxed, and I was standing around and chatting about this and that. And I suddenly heard one of them say, what's this bloody rabble? And I looked round, and I saw a group of pretty rough-looking blokes um, walking along. One had a pickaxe handle, I remember. And as I looked round, the other policeman next to me said, oh, it's all right, they're our bloody rabble. Next, all the street lights went off. Just without any warning at all, the lights all went off. Um, and a few seconds later, there was sounds of shouting and crashing and banging and people getting thumped and people running uh, coming from down the road here. And soon after that, people started staggering out with blood coming from their heads. Policemen started coming out, dragging people they were arresting. And it was quite a scene of chaos. And then all the lights came on again. Behaviour on both sides was degenerating. Police, like rioters, were making use of whatever weapons came to hand. Now, under cover of darkness, the crowd was moving south, ransacking everything in their path. I was asked to go to Duefra Parade. But you don't really know what's, what you're facing. You don't know what's going to be there when you get there. You know you're going to be tested. By 8 o'clock, when fresh reinforcements arrived, fires were raging, and firemen were threatening to withdraw. The crowd were really extremely violent. They, they couldn't care what injuries they caused, or, or even if they killed people, that was quite obvious. We didn't want them marching up that road. We didn't want them marching up the front line. I spent a lot of time on the radio just telling the control that if you don't get reinforcements here soon, we'll have the biggest forced funeral we've ever had. The police had already lost control. Now they were in danger of losing their lives. As rioters pushed forward, the police line was about to be overwhelmed. The fire brigade said they were going to have to go, it was too bad. And they were sort of pulling their hoses together to go. And I said to the chap, how do you turn the hose on? And he said, you mustn't use our hoses because we will be seen as an ally of the police and we'll be targeted in the future. And I said, well, we've got to use them. We've no choice. The police had all but lost the battle. But as the chief superintendent turned on the fire hose, everything turned to his advantage. It was like an iron bar coming out of it. It was a great jet of water, obviously, that you can imagine. And the, it was horizontal, and we just swept the crowd with it, and it was knocking people over. It was a wonderful feeling. And you know, once you start to get wet and stuff, you don't really want to hang about in wet clothes. So that was a, a factor. That was a factor. All that night, the rioters had ruled Brixton. Now, the police were about to reclaim the streets. I turned round and there was the most marvellous sight in the world. There were about, um, I should think about 50 or 60 officers, uh, all bandbox smart with shields and this sort of stuff. All the time, more reinforcements, more, more reinforcements. We just heard sirens, sirens, sirens all the time. I'm tired of this now. I'm fed up now. I felt that they could have been even more just to make them know that this is the time. 
one minute you're in the most appalling problems and within five or six minutes probably, certainly ten minutes at the most, everything had died down. Brixton was sealed off and rioters escaped down back streets to dodge the police roadblocks. The streets were just full of bricks. That, that was a thing I noticed the most, full of bricks, mortar, stones, bottles, smash bottles, it's just a carpet. And um, the police were lined up as far as the eye could see, sipping on their soups and teas and coffees out of polystyrene cups. And that's the first time I realised that these guys, they've got homes to go to. They might even have family, brothers, sisters, mothers, whatever, probably worrying about them. I can understand people being offended by the police. I can understand people being threatened by police presence. Um, I, I, what I couldn't understand, really, was the, the, the ferocity uh, that took place. Black kids were being purged off the streets. They were being beaten up in cells. The establishment had to acknowledge that. I stood up and I fought with them. As far as Brixton's rioters were concerned, the night was a triumph for the whole of Britain's black community. No one knew what would happen tomorrow, but by the early hours, fighting had been replaced by partying. I heard of a party is up um, near where I lived on Brixton Hill. And everyone knew about the riot. Everybody knew about it. Everyone had drink. Everyone had new clothes to show off rings and chains and things like that, and people had new suits and things like that to wear. People celebrating and drinking champagne. There was a, <laughs> there was a few off licenses that got raided that day as well. I never had champagne before that night. So I had a sip. The guy who had it wasn't willing to share it with everybody. He said, oh, you got your own drink. DJ had um, written some lyrics specifically for the occasion. Brixton riot, a murder. Police couldn't push it little further. Brixton riot, a murder. Brixton riot, a murder. If you love the Brixton riot, say murder, murder. And it was a joyous occasion. Across Brixton, more than 30 buildings, shops, and homes were burning. It looked good. It looked good at night time. The, the sky lit up because, I mean, there's quite a few cars burning and smoke in the sky and, you know. It's a good picture. It's, good, it's a good picture. They decided to take us on and this is our response. My first thought. Um, I wonder what happened to Brixton. Broken windows everywhere. Cars just dead. A melted policeman's helmet just lying on the road. It felt shame in a way to say, why, that's what you did to your own community. You kind of feel shame after. The damage caused by the writing will cost hundreds of thousands, maybe a million pounds in repair bills and compensation. In the side streets, still closed and littered with two days of debris, the shopkeepers started to sort. It was only on Sunday morning that the battle's full toll of injury and damage became... The terrorists say that you know, they had wanted to preserve and keep from the police, it was now <laughs> in ruins, as it were. It was terrible. It was like a ghost town because everything was flat and the shops that you used to go in and do your shopping, there was all, there was nothing in there to see. Everything was gone. It, it was just devastation all over the place. So, you know, it was terrible, terrible. 
Nearly 150 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Wreckage totaling more than seven million pounds. Society had now woken up to realize, hold on, there's something happening down in this little town called Brixton and, and it's gonna affect the whole country. It was the worst breakdown in law and order seen on the mainland for nearly 200 years. Britain had never seen its police officers take such a beating. The whole world knew that we had lost control of the streets. And that's something that, that was very difficult to take. The rioters had uh, won the day. Nearly 300 police and 45 rioters had been injured. Miraculously, no one was killed. Vengeance and war don't really justify anything. No. But, but, is one thing I, I would say is that the riot spoke volumes for black people. Shocking to see that what we had done. But with that, there was pride as well that we stood up. Is there anyone here who takes the view that what happened in the last 36 hours was a, was a race issue? No, 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 If the black community had felt the media had ignored their concerns about police brutality in the past, now journalists were queuing up to find out why local feelings had boiled over in such an extreme reaction. I was very much a doubting Thomas uh, about their claims, but the sheer volume of the complaints from people about police behaviour could not be ignored. You, you could say, yes, some of them are exaggerating. You could say, yes, some of them are making it up. But they couldn't all be exaggerating and making it up. How, how long can you suppress a feeling? Right? How long can you suppress a feeling, man? How long? I think it changed uh, our attitudes towards uh, the black and Asian community. And I think it probably made the country as a whole uh, wake up to the fact that there was a problem here that, which had to be addressed. But on Sunday, London's police leaders weren't ready to admit their tactics might have triggered the violence and blamed political extremists. It wasn't just locals uh, from uh, Brixton, but uh, others from elsewhere had come to, to help. And that's why I said it wasn't spontaneous, that it was planned. Do we look like organized people? I mean, you see everybody about it. Do we all look like organized people? Radicalist, racist. We, yeah, we're not writers, we look organized. We're not writers. Do we? Yeah, they might. No, do we look organized? Not to me, you don't right. know. That, 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 that answer your question. Where, where where the, people... the police still wanted to blame a lawless minority amongst the community for what had happened. Anything rather than admit that they had got it seriously wrong. Nothing but nothing justifies what happened on Saturday night, and I cannot condemn it too strongly. At first, the government also seemed reluctant to inspect the causes of the riot. But when Margaret Thatcher sent her Home Secretary to see for himself what had gone on in Brixton, defying all expectations, he'd ensure the riots became a turning point in British history. He came down uh, to have a look around, quaint himself, see what was going on. It's all in the name. William White Law. That was what the government was all about. White Law. Well, there was shouting went on, and uh, one or two people, oh, that Willie White Law. We despised him and what he represented. Thatcher and everyone despised them, hated them. The police have, in their very difficult task, and I want to say this again, again, and again, deserve the support of every law-abiding citizen in this country, because this country faces on all its citizens that responsibility, because we ask the police to carry out these duties on our behalf. He never went anywhere near Railton Road. Uh, he had a quick uh, whiz around the area with the Metropolitan Commissioner at his side. It was clear after about Ten minutes that he'd had enough. But he got the picture. In fairness to him, he did go. He got the picture. And he said to me, uh, uh, Mr. Vernon, I think, uh, I think we ought to go back uh, to Brixton Police Station.
By the time Thatcher's Home Secretary had crossed back over the river, he decided to launch a major public inquiry to be headed by Lord Scarman. The Home Secretary orders a one-man public inquiry into the Brixton riots, but local residents fear it won't examine their long-standing grievances. And a national debate on race and the inner cities soon began. Quite clearly, we've got to limit any further mass immigration into this country, and if any people wish to return to their country of ethnic origin, they should be encouraged to do so He's by the government. Can I the police should recognise that, in fact, it's not on to treat people in what seems to many blacks in Brixton as an oppressive and unjust manner, well, simply because... I hope it's going to be a very quick inquiry. Lord Scarman will report, and I hope he will be very candid in the recommendations that he makes to government. Six months later, when Lord Scarman's findings came out, they weren't what anyone expected under the party of law and order. He didn't look like a revolutionary, but Scarman's inquiry into the riots sent shockwaves through British society. Only at eight pounds. <laughs> For the first time in their history, he put the police as an institution on trial and found them guilty clearly a large degree of responsibility lay at the door of the police service. The police had got the policing of the local area wrong to the extent that they lost control. According to Scarman, that happened because the police had lost the consent of the local community. I think a lot of people had some pretty legitimate grievances about the way we went about our business. Across the country, following the riots, the way the police did business would be transformed. The police could not just police an area as they wanted, um, indiscriminately stopping and searching large numbers of people, for example. The only way to successfully police a community is by consent. For the first time, the police would be compelled to consult the public and become more accountable to the communities they policed. It was, it was a nasty jolt uh, to the police, but it took a long time for the smarting uh, to wear off before the police were willing to take on those ideas. 25 years later, the lessons of Brixton are still being learnt. The police were urged to appoint more black and Asian officers and to root out racists in their ranks. The process of reform has been hard, but Brixton was the catalyst for beginning the change in race relations across Britain. That riot was the beginning of, of the change, and people started to recognise that we had rights. The riot showed everybody that um, if you ignore a certain community for so long, you shit on them for so long, they're going to rise up. A fascinating account of a complex man who should be remembered as a political giant. So says Hugh Edwards of Lloyd George on BBC Four at nine o'clock. Next, here on BBC Two, the quarterfinals of University Challenge. It's the Christmas shopping season in London and the rush hour is in full swing. 